Good morning. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today to the William G. McGowan Theater here in Washington, and a special welcome to our C-SPAN audience joining us from around the country and around the world. Today we have the latest in an ongoing series of Nixon Legacy Forums, which we co-sponsor with the Nixon Foundation and the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California. When asked about his library when it was first planned, being planned, President Nixon said, I have insisted that the Nixon Library and Birthplace be not a monument to the career of one man, but a place where visitors and scholars will be able to recall the events of the time I served as president and to measure and weigh the policies my administration pursued. I hope the Nixon Library and Birthplace will be different, a vital place of discovery and rediscovery of investigation, of study, debate, and analysis. Those words will be our touchstone as we begin a major renovation of the permanent exhibit at the Nixon Library this year. Except for the recently opened Watergate exhibit, the Nixon Library has been essentially unchanged since it opened in the summer of 1990. Over the last 24 years, there have been many changes and many advances in the techniques and technologies of museum display and interactivity and in the volume of material now available. It will be an exciting and exhilarating exercise in bringing the 37th president into the 21st century. Today's Nixon Legacy Forum is the 29th in the series. The idea is simple, bring together some of the men and women who worked on various projects for President Nixon, reunite them with the papers that they wrote, and then engage them in discussion about what it was like to be there working in the Nixon White House. The documentation at the Nixon Library regarding the opening of China, the papers and tape recordings are particularly rich. These forums are not intended to be the definitive history of any subject. They are meant to be the building blocks of history. They're a unique opportunity to provide first person input for current and future scholars and citizens who want to understand how the Nixon policies were really made and how history really works. Dean Acheson famously titled his memoirs Present at the Creation, and the Nixon Library Forums can, take, can make us fly through the walls of history. We are present, I'll bet, at four decades removed at the creation of some of the most momentous policies and events of the last century. Today's forum is a case in point, the opening of China. Few events are truly transformational, but President Nixon's determination to end the quarter century of what he's called China's angry isolation and to restore America's relations with the world's most populous nation count among them. America and the world were transfixed with vivid images of the week that changed the world when President Nixon went to China in February of 1972. Secretary of State Clinton recently remembered renting a small TV set when TV sets still had adjustable rabbit ear antennas so she could watch the coverage in her room at the Yale Law School. She said that calling the Nixon trip to China the week that changed the world was an understatement. The world truly was different on February 28, 1972, the day President Nixon left China, than it had been on February 21st when he arrived. Today's distinguished panelists all worked at the Nixon National Security Council and helped to prepare that momentous and transformational trip. Ron Walker, the chairman of the board of the President Richard Nixon Foundation, will introduce today's distinguished moderator and panelists. Please welcome Ron Walker. Morning, everyone. The panel's gonna come out. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone along, uh, along with David. Uh, it's really nice to see all these lovely faces out there. Um, those of us on the White House staff in the 70s remember a young lady named Catherine Toya. She was on the NSC Council at 18 years of age. She worked at night doing the President's briefing for the next morning. And uh, she would ride her bicycle from George Washington University to the White House and work in the Situation Room. She went on to serve in the National Security 
post for President Ford and President Reagan. In 1984, she wrote Secretary of Defense Cap Weinberger's memorandum, The Uses of Military War. The speech and she received the Defense Department's highest civilian award for the work that she did during the Reagan administration. Today, KT is a Fox News security analyst, and she hosts the foxnews.com DEFCOM 3. KT is moderating this series of Nixon legacies for the 37th President of the United States on foreign policy. She will introduce the panel, which is a distinguished one, I might add, and all my friends. God bless. Thank you, Ron. Ron, Ron Walker is far too modest to mention it, but he played an essential role in President Nixon's opening to China. He did all the advance work for Nixon's trip, and it was groundbreaking in every way. It was the first time a primetime presidential trip overseas event had happened in prime time. It was the first time American people saw China in over a generation, and it was the first time more than just a handful of Americans had ever been to China. So Ron isn't a part of this panel today, but if you want to get a real behind-the-scenes look of Nixon's trip to China, you can read the book Ron's wife Anne wrote called China Calls by Ann Walker. Thank, well, thank you. Now, you know, this is the second in a several-part series of forums, as, as the archivist said, about Nixon administration's national security policy. And it, those five years that Nixon was in office have been considered one of the most fruitful times of American diplomacy and really the golden age of American foreign policy certainly of the century. Um, the last forum focused on how the National Security Council was organized. So foreign policy and decision making was restructured and focused in the National Security Council and in Nixon's hands personally. We're going to have future forums and they're going to focus on detente and arms control with the Soviet Union, ending the Vietnam War and the Paris Peace Accords, and probably a final forum on the lasting legacy of the Nixon-Kissinger era. But this one is devoted to the opening to China. Um, it is, as the archivist said, the seminal event changed the world. And I want to introduce you to the gentleman who helped make it happen. So joining us today first, Winston Lord. Winston joined Henry Kissinger's NSC staff at the very beginning of the Nixon administration. He was one of Henry's closest advisors throughout the administration, and he worked on every aspect of American foreign policy. He was in and out of Kissinger's office several times a day. Um, he helped plan Henry Kissinger's secret trip to China in July 71, and he became a central role not only in the trips to China, but then in the subsequent um, unfolding of American Chinese foreign policy. He went on to become president of the Council on Foreign Relations, Assistant Secretary of State, and U.S. Ambassador to China. Next is Dr. Richard Solomon. He was a University of Michigan professor, uh, and already a nationally renowned China scholar, when Kissinger tapped him to join the National Security Council staff in September of 1971. Dick had a PhD from my alma mater, MIT. He was a senior scholar at the prestigious Rand Corporation and spoke fluent Mandarin. He accompanied Henry Kissinger and Deputy NSC Advisor General Al Haig on numerous China trips, and he was also on President Nixon's 1972 trip to China. Dick went on to hold senior positions in the State Department, negotiate the Cambodian Peace Treaty, and serve as ambassador to the Philippines. He's written numerous books, and, they re and he remains one of America's leading sinologists. And he recently stepped down as the president of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and not in retirement for a nanosecond, he is now the senior fellow at the Rand Corporation. Thank you. And next to Dick is Ambassador Nicholas Platt. Unlike our other panelists, um, Ambassador Platt was not on Kissinger's National Security Council staff, although he was longtime friend and colleague of Winston Lord and Dick Solomon's. Um, Nick was a career foreign service officer and one of the State Department's senior sinologists. He was also on the Nixon trip, but he was the staff assistant to then Secretary of State William uh, Rogers. Uh, Nick Platt went on to hold senior positions at the State Department, Defense, NSC, was ambassador to Nib Namibia, the Philippines, and Pakistan. And after leaving government, he dealt, has dealt extensively with the Chinese through the last 40 years. Uh, finally is Admiral Jonathan Howe, who was a young commander on Henry Kissinger's National Security Council staff. He was Kissinger's military assistant. He was one of the only military officers on the staff and the only naval officer 
right? Then a Lieutenant Commander John Howe was a naval, graduated from the Naval Academy, spent most of his time at sea as a submariner, and went on to a very distinguished career in the Navy, became a four-star admiral, and he was also President George H.W. Bush's Deputy National Security Advisor. So these are pretty distinguished men who had great careers before they joined up with Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon and clearly continued to be on the forefront of the elite of American foreign policy going forward. Uh, I'd like to get to the right to it, though. I want to ask each of, us, each of you how you happen to be associated with Henry specifically. How did Henry find you? Well, I was a foreign service officer originally, and I was working in the Pentagon in 1968, and the first person that Kissinger asked to join him on his staff was the head of the policy planning staff in the Pentagon where I was working, a man named Mort Halpern. So Halpern went over to join Kissinger and asked me uh, to go with him. I had a quick interview uh, with Henry, and I guess I passed. And the first year, I was sort of a mini policy planning staff with Halpern, sending memos to Henry, many of them criticizing what he was doing, and that's why I got his attention, uh, and also running the NSC system. And then I became a special assistant in February 70, and I was fortunate because I was involved not only in this, but in the Vietnam negotiations, the Russian and Middle East uh, initiatives as well. Dick, how did Henry find you? I was recommended by the Council on Foreign Relations. David Rockefeller had set up a, uh, an International Affairs Fellows Program. And in uh, March or April of 1971, uh, I was recommended to uh, Kissinger because he was taking uh, scholars or, or recommendees from the council uh, on, on his staff. Actually, it was the second, second year of that program. So uh, I got a letter in the spring of 71, this is before the secret trip, saying that uh, I would be uh, welcome to join the staff for a year as uh, in a, an academic in that context. And I was teaching the summer of uh, 71 at Michigan uh, in preparation for taking the year's leave, and I was as shocked as the world was when uh, President Nixon got on television and announced that uh, okay. Kissinger had a already been to China secretly. And uh, immediately I started getting phone calls from uh, colleagues in the State Department saying, boy, are you lucky you're going to be in the middle of a lot of very interesting things. So I showed up uh, at the end of the summer. And uh, fr from that point on, I just uh, became uh, a member of that team. And uh, it worked out well enough so that I was asked to stay on beyond the first year and ended up working for Kissinger and then Scowcroft for five years. Mm -hmm. What about you? You were at the State Department, Nick. How did Henry find you? Well, I was thrown together with Henry um, when we were coordinating the papers for the, for the Nixon trip. Secretary Rogers asked me to pull the papers together, and uh, I had, been worked, had worked in the Secretariat, and so I had some idea of how to do this, and I'd worked in, on China. So I, I brought over the papers to discussed them with Wynne and, 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 uh, and with Henry himself. Uh, Henry was very anxious that we all be uh, singing from the same sheet of music, and so I was showing them our sheet of music to make sure that it was the same as his, and, and, uh, and it was. Anyway, that was how we met. And what about you? Well, I had just finished two years of graduate school, Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, up in the Cambridge area. It took Kissinger's last course that he taught at Harvard on national security. Uh, <clears throat> but that was a large seminar. He didn't know me from that. Your I had, brilliance hadn't shown through until later. I had, I had orders to, a, to back to a submarine, to be XO of a submarine. And I got a phone call from the Navy saying, come to Washington. We can't tell you why. Just <laughs> come. And don't, don't go back to New London right now. So, so I came, obviously, and that turned out to be an interview with Haig and Kissinger, et cetera. And uh, I was very worried about going, wanting to go back to submarines and sort of bargaining, you know, this is only going to be a year. And when they finally brought me over, they said, well, this could be two years. So four and a half years later, <laughs> I got back to the Navy, but I had a very uh, enjoyable experience. And the only reason he knew about me uh, was that some professors, unbeknownst to me, that were uh, advisors on my thesis, et cetera, had uh, written to Kissinger and said, this is somebody you ought to have. Really? They never saw the letter, and they never said anything to me at all. So it was totally out of the blue. But that's 
the reason that they learned who I was. Excellent. Um, I'd like to start off now about the setting the stage of the historical record. Where was the United States um, in, in the 19, late 1960s? You know, it, it, you think now about China, it's hard to think about a time when China was a central player in the world, in the world events and world politics and also a central player with the United States. But that wasn't the case in 1968 when um, Nixon ran for president or in 1969 when Nixon took office. Uh, Dick, why don't you set the stage for the historic perspective of the situation? Well, here we are, uh, 2014, a world that has been totally transformed since the uh, era of the Nixon initiative. We're almost a half a century away from President Nixon making the first moves to establish contact with the Chinese. Today, the Soviet Union is history. China is now approaching uh, certainly number two, if not number one, in the world economy. It, it has emerged, risen uh, as an international force uh, in no small measure because of the opening that uh, President Nixon and Chairman Mao initiated. But let's go back uh, very briefly to uh, what the world looked like when the Soviet Union had allied and uh, China had allied themselves. Uh, Chairman Mao, right after the conclusion of the revolution, had established an, a strategic alliance with the Soviet Union. So Eurasia, from Eastern Europe all the way to the Pacific Ocean, was controlled, dominated by a hostile alliance. It was a fundamental threat to American security. And that threat uh, persisted and was certainly one of the motivations for uh, the Vietnam War involvement. But uh, as the 1960s progressed, there were signs of real tension between uh, Moscow and Beijing. And Mr. Nixon, who was at that point, of course, out of office, would have been aware of these uh, tensions. He was also very much aware of the uh, degree to which the Vietnam War had undermined s political support for the Lyndon Johnson administration. Indeed, it got so bad that, uh, as you know, President Johnson decided not to run for a second term. So uh, sort of in the second half of the 60s, Mr. Nixon, anticipating that he might run for office, started thinking, how do I prevent my administration, should it happen, from from being entrapped in the Vietnam quagmire. He made a trip through uh, Asia in 1967, and he wrote a really fascinating article in the journal Foreign Affairs uh, that hinted at the, uh, not only the desire to get out of Vietnam, because the title of the article was Asia After Vietnam, but he hinted that uh, it was important to try to draw China into the international community. So this was very much in his head. So he was saying, how do I construct a policy to deal with this situation? And the, the brilliance of what he put together was he could see the tensions between the two communist states. He thought that might be the ba basis for uh, splitting that alliance. Uh, and he was looking for a way to accelerate or gain some leverage on getting out of the Vietnam situation. So as he prepared to run for office, he was talking publicly about he had a secret plan to end the Vietnam War. He didn't mention China, but frankly, there was uh, more than a little guffawing, at least on the Michigan campus. Sure, Nixon has a secret plan to get out of Vietnam, but he really did. And so his game plan is one of the great strategic maneuvers certainly in American foreign policy, and I would say in international politics of the, the 20th century, because what finally transpired, the uh, breakthrough to uh, improve relations with China and all that followed, fundamentally transformed the political dynamic of the Cold War, certainly to America's advantage, and it uh, put the Soviet Union on the defensive, and it laid the basis for China's international engagement, which then played out over decades, not only after, after Mao, but Deng Xiaoping. You know, Windsor, when you were on the National Security Council um, leading up to the secret trip, so you were already there, you were already Kissinger's assistant, did they talk to you about this? Did you know that that was in Nixon's mind from the very beginning? Uh, yes. Uh, I got fully briefed when I became special assistant in February 1970, but as we'll get to later, uh, in the first week of Nixon's uh, term, he sent a memo to Kissinger saying, let's get in touch with the Chinese. But uh, 
Let me just follow up on what Dirk has just said in terms of the impulses by both sides to get together after 22 years of mutual hostility uh, and isolation. In addition to the foreign scene that Dick has painted, there's also the domestic scene that Nixon inherited, 550,000 troops in Vietnam, a tension with the nuclear rival of the Soviet Union, uh, no contact with one-fifth of the world's people. Uh, and at home, you had uh, riots, assassinations, uh, and people being disillusioned with executive power and uh, particularly the uh, Vietnam War. So the first impulse, I think the most broad impulse of, Kissing, of Nixon opening to China was to show the world and to show the American people that we were not bogged down in Vietnam, that our diplomacy could flourish despite the incredible context that he inherited, and to break out of this mold that the U.S. no longer could be a world leader despite, despite Vietnam. Uh, and as a correlate to that, to lift the spirits of the American people over many years. He knew that any exit from Vietnam was going to be messy and ambiguous. So he felt if he opened with China, this huge country, the drama and the importance of dealing with that giant would put in perspective the rather messy exit from Vietnam. So let's not underestimate the broad diplomatic uh, breakthrough and achievement for his foreign policy in general and what he did with the American people's morale, but more specifically, Number one, he wanted to improve relations with the Soviet Union, and the best way to do that was to get their attention by going to China. Number two, he wanted help in ending the Vietnam War, as you suggested, figuring that if he opened with China and then with Russia, that Hanoi would see that it was being somewhat isolated uh, by its two big patrons who were interested in bilateral relations with us. He also, over time, wanted greater stability in Asia generally. Those are his objectives. On the Chinese side, they had two major objectives. One, their concern about their polar bear northern neighbor. They had these uh, clashes along the Usuri River. Uh, they saw Brezhnev in 68 declare the Brezhnev Doctrine and, and take over Czechoslovakia, in effect saying, we'll run the communist world. Uh, and so they were concerned about the Soviets. And secondly, they were totally isolated. Because of the Cultural Revolution, they withdrew all but one of their ambassadors from abroad. So they're, twin objectives was balance the Russians and break out of their isolation. Here's a classic case where both sides achieved their goals, essentially. Within weeks of the secret trip and Nixon's announcement, Moscow agreed to a summit meeting with Nixon as well. Uh, they had been dragging their feet for a year or two. And we had a Berlin agreement. We had an arms control agreement. We made major breakthrough with the Russians. Secondly, it did help us uh, put pressure on Vietnam, but that was a much longer operation. But certainly in terms of American diplomacy, as I've said, it showed that we were a major actor on the world stage again. So it achieved, and of course greatly enhanced Nixon's popularity, so it achieved our major objectives. The Chinese, in turn, balanced the Soviet Union, got uh, some security against them, and they broke out of their isolation. Uh, they knew that if we opened up with them, then Japan, which had been holding back in Europe, would go ahead with normal relations. They would get into the United Nations, which they did in October 1971. So this was a major move, obviously, for the reasons Dick has mentioned. And it's also a case of a win-win situation in international diplomacy. But who were the losers? Uh, and Nick, you were at the State Department, and our relations with China were with Taiwan. We're not with Red China, it was called at the time. No. Uh, what, were we selling China out? I mean, the China, which was Taiwan? Well. Um, we were sticking strictly to the policy of supporting Taiwan. I was in charge of, uh, I was in, in, the, in the China desk when, we, when the transition between <laughs> uh, Johnson and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Nixon took place. And my, one of my tasks was to write a history of Lyndon Baines Johnson's uh, achievements in China policy. Now, this was a slim volume at best, uh, but, uh, but it gave me uh, a chance to look in the files and see all of the different uh, the initiatives that we had, uh, we had worked on, sent forward to Dean Rusk, which we then sent back. Okay. <laughs> the change when Nixon came in was palpable. Um, we were asked by the Secretary's office to brush off the various initiatives that we'd made on cultural exchange and sports and education and so on. And so we sent them forward, and uh, they disappeared. And they must have gone to the White House. 
anyway, we didn't have a clue what was going on between. So the State the, Department was kept out of the we, we, what we, was we, roiling we, at the state at the. De uh, the, 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 we were not privy to what, what Nixon and Kissinger and Wynne Lord were cooking up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me interject quickly, though. These papers were absolutely crucial for the preparation for Kissinger's trip and Nixon's trip. Because we, we weren't filled with a lot of China experts. John Holder is somewhat of one. Unfortunately, he's not with us. But we relied a lot on some of the background mm -hmm. and papers that were sent to us, even though they didn't know why they were sending them. <laughs> no, we just were doing our job, and we sent them. But, but those of us who, who had read the Nixon article and those of us who uh, were uh, sensitive to these different vibrations realized that something was up. We didn't know what it was, but something was up. And, uh, of course, there were a lot of uh, intelligence uh, an analyses going on. I spent some time doing that. Uh, and during, particularly in the context of the clashes between uh, the Soviet Union and, and, and China along the border. And this these was in 1969. This is 69, and, and, uh, and uh, we wrote uh, reports, and, and the policy implications were that they were going to uh, improve the uh, improve the atmosphere for uh, China and the United States to get together. And this began the period of winking that went on, you know, and, and, and uh, signs at the Warsaw talks and so on and so forth. But the, so it was, th there were some very public aspects to Nixon's, um, uh, to Nixon's policies. There were relaxations of trade and, tra and, and travel restrictions and things like that, which laid the, the groundwork for what was going on behind the scene. Dick? But let me just add that uh, the, the University of Michigan campus was in turmoil through the late 60s. Right, in the anti-war demonstration. Tremendous, tremendous fear of getting drawn into another war with China, as we had in the, the Korean War period, because of the Vietnam conflict. And so there was tremendous tension building over would we get involved in another conflict uh, with China? And uh, there was an organization set up just as I began my teaching career uh, in 66 called the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations where particularly the academic community was trying to find ways to uh, avoid a, another clash with China. So the public mood, and I'm sure Winston will get off into this, was sort of primed for uh, some breakthrough that would relieve that, that fear, that tension that we'd be drawn into another war with China. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd like to do now is, is talk about the steps leading up to. You know, Nick, you talked about some of the signals that were being sent. You talked about, Dick, the fear that the United States was somehow going to drift into another war in, with China um, after the Korean War. So in 1969, 1970, China was one of America's arch enemies. Understandably, then, the world was shocked when Nixon went on television from San Clemente in July of 71 and said, Henry Kissinger has just completed a secret trip to China, and President Nixon would himself go visit China several months later. That secret trip, how did that get organized? We didn't have diplomatic relations. You couldn't pick up the phone and say, hello, Joe and Lai, we'd like to come visit. What, it talks, it talk us through the steps, public yeah, okay. moves, private moves. Well, we had a double challenge from the beginning in 69, knowing we wanted to move toward China. First, there was the public uh, signals that had to be sent, both so China would pick up these signals, and our publics and our other countries would begin to get used to the idea that we were moving in a different direction. So as has been pointed out by, by Nick, we relaxed trade and travel restrictions. I won't give all the chronology here. But we did other things. Uh, the president, in a toast uh, with the Romanian uh, head of state, used the phrase, People's Republic of China. No president had ever used uh, that phrase uh, before. Uh, we made certain references in the president's annual foreign policy reports, which came out in February every year, in which we indicated a further direction. Uh, and so th the beauty of these gestures were they were unilateral. They did not require a response from the Chinese. We were not negotiating in public, but they could be noted by the Chinese leaders as well as the other audiences that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. The other problem is to get in touch with them, as you say. And so we began to look for a secret intermediaries because we had no direct contact. We tried Charles de Gaulle of France briefly, 
We tried Romania, which got fairly interesting for a while. But we were th trying various channels and see which ones the Chinese would pick up they were most comfortable with. And they settled on Pakistan, which was a close friend of theirs and was close to us in the Cold War. So we had begun to condition the publics, and then we had set up the secret channel. So then we had a series of. So talk, talk to me about what the secret channel is. Yeah, I will. Did, you, did you say to the <coughs> president of Pakistan, no, we'd like to get in touch the with the president Chinese? president of Pakistan said he, he came on a state visit and said he'd be willing to be, be the intermediary. And so we began, the way it would happen is that Joe and Lai would write a message, you'd get it to the Pakistanis, they would send it to their ambassador in Washington, who would come in and see Kissinger, and I was always there with the handwritten notes or typed notes from Joe and Lai, and then we'd go back the same way. Now, what was important in this was not only to converge on an agreement for a trip and decide who was going to go on that trip, it ended up being uh, Kissinger, with great reluctance, of course, but uh, <laughs> so anyway, he was uh, A number he was of Kissinger's chosen. staff members are here, which is why you're getting yeah. that chuckle. But, but the, the key issue was that uh, China wanted just to talk about Taiwan. We had had talks in Geneva and Warsaw over many years, and by the way, another signal was we tried to get our ambassador, Walter Stessel, to run down the Chinese ambassador in Warsaw, and he couldn't catch up with him, but that was another signal. Uh, so. What we had to do was make sure that if anybody went to China, which was a very risky geopolitical and political gamble, that the agenda would be a lot broader than the very sticky issue of Taiwan. So the key issue to be worked out in private was to make sure the agenda was broad. And once the Chinese agreed to a broader agenda, that's when we settled on a trip. I'll make one last comment, and I want my colleagues to weigh in. Uh, there was one public event that was important, the famous ping pong diplomacy. And the timing was crucial because we had gone back and forth through the Pakistani channel, but we had not heard back from the Chinese. I may not have my dates exactly right, but about the beginning of 1971, we hadn't heard anything for two or three months. So we're beginning to get a little antsy. Then you have the American ping pong team for a world championship in Tokyo, and the Chinese invite them to the mainland. This was Mao's personal idea, by the way. And it did several things. One, it told the world, not to mention his own cadres and domestic audience, that he was going to reach out to the US uh, more subtly than just the, the ping pong uh, initiative. Uh, secondly, it was a public answer to our private channel, which we had not heard back from. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, however, there was a veiled fist here. Namely, if we don't sort of engage with them, he can put pressure on us through public opinion like this ping pong diplomacy. So we got the picture, and in fact, about two weeks later, we did get the crucial message in late April uh, through the Pakistani channel setting up the Kissinger trip. Winston, let me just uh, add that the Chinese had put out their own signal. In October of 1970, Chairman Mao invited Edgar Snow, who was, you know had become famous for his book uh, written during the Civil War period, Red Star Over China, invited Edgar Snow to meet with him and uh, uh, appear on the Tiananmen Gate for this National Day Parade. And uh, Edgar Snow then wrote uh, an article uh, that appeared in Life magazine. This is the fall of 1970. And my understanding is the message really didn't get through. Yeah, I we, mean, we, we the, we the mindset right. on all sides was so, so negative. Uh -huh. And then probably because of uh, the internal turmoil in China of the Cultural Revolution, there may have been a period of pullback. Well, there are some other sort of signals uh, going on. Uh, we had um, suggested rec that the Warsaw talks actually be moved to the embassies. And they had previously taken place for years. Now, what were the Warsaw talks? Go back. Warsaw and talks were talks that we'd had with the Chinese for decades about prisoner exchanges, mainly. And it was our only sort of direct contact with with the Chinese uh, during those years. Um, and they had been in abeyance for, 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 for some time. They were also very public. They were in a place called the Mitslavitsky Palace, which was uh, eminently buggable. And uh, the, the, <laughs> the gossip was that a taxi going by could, could tune in to the Warsaw talks. Uh, so the, uh, the suggestion was that we move the Warsaw talks into embassies, one month in one embassy, one month in another. And that process actually began. But it was interrupted. And I think the interruption, which I think which, which Winston's been talking about, 
came about uh, as, as a reaction to the uh, um, invasion of Cambodia, which in fact put things on hold. We called it an incursion at the time. But <laughs> you can uh, this call, was it, call it as you wish. But in any <laughs> case, a work. They, they, the Chinese saw it as a reason to, to slow down. Let me, yeah, John, because you were in the military at that time. How were you saying well, it? I just, just want to underline one thing that uh, has been said. I think there was a, a serious Chinese concern about the Russians and what was happening on their border and a buildup of almost a million troops and so forth and some clashes that were, were occurring. So in Mao's mind and the Chinese leadership mind, they, they really were very concerned that this was a serious threat to them. And so getting along with the Americans, they didn't feel we were territorial, ambitious, et cetera, et cetera, but they thought the Russians would be. So this is a, a motivating factor to keep this uh, start and keep it going and keep these contacts and see what might be possible. You know, elaborate a little more on that because we think of the triangular diplomacy, the United States, Soviet Union, China. We think we were running that game. But what you're implying is that the Chinese were looking at this triangle, looking to see if they could find a new alliance. Yeah, and the U.S. might be, be someone they could depend on more than, than the, the Russian part of that triangle. Mm -hmm. It was interesting, by the way, in the midst of this, the Russians made an overture to Nixon and Kissinger saying, why don't we gang up on the Chinese? And uh, Nixon didn't think that was a particularly when good idea. When was this? This would have been in the, Before the, the, summer, the summer of 69, actually. Summer of 69, when they were having these tensions along the border. Right. There were national security study memos being uh, circulated and talked about within the bureaucracy, which uh, talked about b relations with China, relations with uh, with with Russia. They were they were hotly debated. There was also uh, a big um, argument within the uh, community, the intelligence community, uh, in which I was <coughs> involved, which discussed the question of whether or not nuclear castration of China was possible by Russia. I mean, that's how serious it was. A Sino-Soviet nuclear war. Yeah. But in this respect, and with regard to the Soviet Union, several of our top criminologists, I'm going to get the names wrong, but I believe, and I, if I'm wrong, it can be corrected, but including Chip Bolin and George Cannon and some others, told Nixon that you should not move precipitously toward China. It will hurt our relations with the Russians. So he was being told by some Soviet experts not to move toward China, that it would hurt our relations. Of course, Nixon and his brilliance knew that the best way to get Russians' attention or make a breakthrough was to move toward China, which, of course, is what happened. Let's, uh, let's explore a little bit this triangular diplomacy where the United States was playing one off against the other. Dick, why don't you weigh in on that? Well, I don't know how explicitly this, this was conceived at the moment, but what emerged uh, as, as the diplomacy unfolded, is that we were in the favorable so-called swing position where the Russians and or the Soviets and the Chinese started, if you like, competing for good relations with us. They had bad relations um, between themselves, so we were in the favorable position where we could uh, uh, respond to their interest in improved relations with the United States in a variety of ways. Winston has touched on this related to the Vietnam situation, to trying to activate uh, nuclear diplomacy with, with the Soviet Union. So the strategic triangle, as it emerged out of the, the Nixon initiative, put the United States in a uh, very favorable position. And it's sort of interesting today to say, well, is there a new dynamic to uh, the, these triangle relations? But maybe it's the Chinese who would be in the stronger swing position. But that's that's for another panel. That's for another, another now, you session. Talk about where you right. where, when you were working these internal memoranda, Nixon, Kissinger, Winston Lord, et cetera, with this very small group of people, were you looking at that as this would be our opportunity to get to the both things that we wanted, an opening to China as well as arms control with the Soviet Union and oh, end of the Vietnam War. Yeah. So absolutely. it was, it was and yeah. the way we played it, I want John to elaborate at some point yeah. because yeah. he was crucial in uh, in playing the Soviet dimension with the Chinese. Mm -hmm. uh, he can get into that, and he should. Uh, but basically, our strategy was to make the Russians anxious and nervous about our opening to China, but at the same time to sort of demonstrate to the Chinese that we had more actual business with Moscow than we did with Beijing. We had a more normal relationship. We could have arms control. We could have grain agreements. 
uh, we could have principles of international relations. Uh, and so the Chinese were a little antsy at the same time. And we would go out of our way. Kissinger would always go there after the Moscow summit or other Russian encounters and sort of brief them, both out of courtesy and reassure the Chinese, but also to make them a little bit nervous about uh, the amount of business we had with them. And then, of course, we shared our views uh, on uh, Soviet uh, military strengths, and that's where John should come in at some yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, what was the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union? I mean, we'll talk about that at a, as a subsequent panel, <coughs> but where were the pressure points there? I mean, what were we doing with the Soviet Union, arms control, and well, obviously Vietnam? Obviously, we were in the Cold War, and, and the Russians, the Soviet Union, was the, was the main reason that there was a Cold War, and it was, was going on and, and intense. Uh, at the same time, we were, we were trying to uh, open relations with the uh, Soviet Union, uh, arms control agreements, lots of these things, all sorts of agreements about how we can operate in this semi-hostile world, uh, but law of the sea. There are a whole bunch of things that were going on to try to uh, improve that relationship. And I, I think what's unusual is that, or amazing actually when you think the 1972, I know we'll get to that, but here you have a presidential visit to China and two months later you have a presidential visit to Russia and, um, and meetings at the highest levels, agreements, uh, success in both both areas. And uh, so this, this was a, an amazing buildup the, and the China trip was certainly the first part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't, we were, the, the Russians were the big providers for Vietnam and they were pushing it. Vietnam obviously was a huge issue. Nixon had run for presidency and like all presidents do when wars are on, saying I'll end that war if I get elected. Mm -hmm. And uh, here we were and eventually we got to 1972 and, and uh, the Vietnam War was not over, the agreement wasn't there, and, and so forth. I mean, this is really a dynamic year. And when you look back and think of all the different things that went on, uh, it, it is significant. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, what Winston was trying to get to is that we were providing some information once this relationship started on these trips uh, to uh, let the Chinese know specifically what the Russians were doing. <coughs> Obviously, they have their own intelligence, but at least uh, mm -hmm. to let them know for, through our satellites and other means. Right, which they would not have had access what, to. What we, where the alignment was, and uh, we tried to give it very accurately and mm -hmm. honestly, mm -hmm. but uh, it was a significant buildup, and they were concerned about it. Okay. Um, uh, let me add. Okay, John keep was going, guys. Specifically, the guy who presented <laughs> this material. Uh, to, to the Chinese. I, I would sit in, and I was a spear carrier, but he was explaining to them, uh, this is all unclassified now, essentially, uh, Russian deployments and so on. One other quick point on the dynamics of the summits. We had asked the Soviets for a summit throughout 1970, and we were still asking. As we took off, Haig was holding the fort for Kissinger back in Washington. And he called on the uh, Soviet ambassador to Brennan and gave him one last chance to agree to a summit. We would have gone to Moscow first. Once again, uh, Brennan said, no, nah, we're not quite ready for it. Uh, and we had left word with Haig to call us. We were on a public trip leading up to the secret trip. We were in Southeast yeah. Asia and, and South Asia. So the idea of Haig was to call us and see how this came out with Brennan. So I got on the phone. I think it was either Thailand or Vietnam, and I got the call from Haig. And he gave me some code language that uh, a six-year-old could figure out what he was saying. I think it wasn't very subtle. But basically said the Russians have turned us down. So of course we went to China first, and then the Russians agreed within weeks to a summit yeah. meeting after that. Yeah. Well, let's go me to the, meanwhile, yeah. let me say meanwhile. Back at the State Department. Let, the yeah. State Department. <laughs> let, meanwhile, let me say that uh, the, um, when the, Chinese, the campaign to get the Chinese into the UN was oh. gathering momentum. And the State Department, saluting as always, was mass uh, having a massive, mounting a massive campaign to lobby against this uh, and Oops. in favor of Taiwan. Uh, so that was also what was going on. Um, in the meantime, I was asked as the head of uh, 
from the China watching part of the State Department to write a memo on what kind of a um, member of the UN China would make. Hmm. So there were all of these different currents. This uh, was China the bull shop. <laughs> right. Oh! Now that was the real title of a memo. <laughs> Let's switch to the secret trip to China. Um, so Winston, you said you were doing these various right. you know, initiatives to try right. to find that somebody from the Chinese right. government, you had these secret memos that were going back and forth on a piece of paper. What happened? How did Kissinger get to China right. without it, the world It could knowing? never happen again, let's face it. He was scheduled for a public trip to Vietnam, Thailand, India, and Pakistan. And we were in a small plane. I'll never forget this. We had three different types of briefing books. There was a briefing book for four people who were going into China. There was a briefing book for those four, but also a couple more, a guy named Hal Saunders, a Middle East expert, who were going to not go to China, but were, had to know what was going on to help cover up where the hell we were when we were supposed to be in Pakistan. <laughs> then there was a briefing book who had no idea we were going to China. And so we had three different briefing books, which I was in charge of. Mm -hmm. I would just finish updating, go to sleep, and Kissinger would wake up and make me redo all three again. And I had to make sure each person got the right briefing book. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, to make a long story short, my colleagues are going to groan here, but I have to explain to the audience and to history that Kissinger was not the first person into China after 22 <laughs> years. You've all heard it, I'm sorry, but I was first because we were flying. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's absolutely true, and Kissinger admits it in his memoirs. We were flying in a secret... That's because Kissinger thought somebody might be shooting when you walked off the That's morning. right. Uh, you were his taster. I, I'll leave you in suspense on that and just double back for a minute. The idea was that when we got to Pakistan, Kissinger was going to get sick with a stomach ache, supposedly go to a hill station, uh, uh, and uh, while he was supposedly there, we were going to sneak off for 48 hours to Beijing. A couple of problems. On the plane, as we were in, in India, Kissinger got a real stomach ache. <laughs> So we had to pretend he wasn't sick because he figured it wouldn't work. <laughs> so th then we get there. And by the way, we had interviewed a couple of Pakistani doctors to make sure they could go up and take care of so-called Kissinger who was being impersonated by Secret Service men up in this hill station. And I asked one doctor, uh, do you know what Kissinger looks like? He said, oh, yeah, of course. I said, you're the wrong doctor. Uh, <laughs> so we get on the plane. There's some Chinese there to meet us. And now you've been in suspense. but. No American had been there, no official, for 22 years. We were in a Pakistani plane, so everybody in the front was Pakistani. I was in the back of a plane with Kissinger and a couple of others. And as we headed to a Chinese airspace, I went to the front of the plane. Henry was in the back, and so I was the first person in the China. As well. <laughs> now, he elbowed me, aside, elbowed me aside when we got off the planes, but I was still number one. All right. Uh, so we spent 48 hours there. The picture you're seeing is the first night at dinner uh, during the secret trip. And uh, on the American side, on the lower left, and you have John Holdridge, who was absolutely crucial to the whole opening, Henry himself, and a Dick Smyzer, who was a Vietnam expert, because that was a major dimension. And you have Joe and Lai over on, on the right-hand side. Uh, we spent 48 hours there in total secrecy, essentially examining what an agenda might look like, whether we could, in fact, have a meaningful presidential trip because we were exploring new terrain. And uh, also a, a short announcement announcing the trip by both sides. And that got to be difficult because the Chinese wanted to make it look like Nixon was dying to go to China. In fact, he had made some comments earlier in his life that he liked to go to China. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make it look like the, Chi the Chinese were dying to have him come to China. So that actually took several hours and rather hair-raising because we only had a few hours left to work out that actual brief announcement to, that Nixon made uh, in San Clemente. Uh, later on. Uh, so I'll just end up on that, except to say a couple of the amusing things in that trip as we flew in toward China. You would think Kissinger was worried about meeting Zhou Enlai, the James Bond aspect of the secrecy, the geopolitical earthquake that he was about to unveil. No, 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 no. He was worried about he had no shirts. <laughs> His staff assistant forgot to pack any shirts. So, he was uh, supposed to be in his pajamas. He so, was going to so be So Henry sick. was really upset. I, I don't blame him. You know, this is a big event. He bought John Holder's shirt. John Holder's about 6'2", so Henry went around looking like a penguin. <laughs> and the shirt had a label that said, made in Taiwan. So, 
Let, uh, let me just make uh, one uh, it, uh, comment from the Chinese point of view. What was not known was during this secret uh, visit, there was another, there was an ally of communist China also in Beijing, and that was Kim Il-sung. And Zhou Enlai had the problem of shuttling back and forth between the meeting with, uh, with Kissinger and his party and dealing with their ally, North Korea. Mm. And uh, the Chinese uh, leadership was really uh, balancing off what it was trying to do with the United States against its uh, alliance relationships, not just with, uh, with North Korea, but also with Vietnam. And so immediately after the Kissinger party departed, Zhou Enlai first flew back to Pyongyang to, uh, to brief Kim Il-sung on what had happened, and then they communicated to the Vietnamese who were outraged. They talked about betrayal in the, in the socialist movement. And, but the, from the Chinese point of view, the diplomacy that was associated with this uh, initiative was very complicated. Uh, let's, let's explore a little bit more what was going on in China at the time, the Cultural Revolution, the coup attempts. Uh, so from their perspective, could only Mao be the one to do this deal? And, and what, was, what was Mao and Zhou Enlai, what were they dealing with at home? Because they must have had a lot of criticism among their own people. Well, Nick may want to jump in here. Yeah, but, everybody jump but, in. But the way. fact was, it was an enormous political risk for both Mao and for Richard Nixon. And one would have to say that Nixon managed his internal politics more effectively because after the secret initiative, there was a coup attempt uh, by the man who we thought had been designated as uh, Mao's successor, the, the defense minister, Lin Biao. We now know that, uh, I forget the exact date, but uh, after this coup attempt, uh, Lin Biao got in a plane fleeing, fearing arrest. The plane crashed in uh, Mongolia. Yeah, it was, I think, October it was 71, I think, uh, when we were there, and it was a very heavy police presence. We didn't know why. It had already happened. I think it had already, already happened. Yeah, yeah but, September it probably happened. Yeah. But we later got the intelligence reporting that uh, there were people uh, in the Chinese leadership who were strongly opposed to this initiative. They kept referring to Mao as a B-50, it was the B-52, the heavy bomber of, of their politics. And uh, probably those included what later became known as the Gang of Four, because uh, Mao's wife, uh, Zhang Qing, and, and others uh, were opposed to some of the developments that uh, had brought uh, influence to Zhou Enlai, uh, worried about the, the future of the revolution. And uh, this is, again, gets beyond the, uh, the immediate uh, story, but uh, beginning around 1974, particularly after Zhou Enlai was ill, uh, was replaced by Deng Xiaoping, uh, the so-called Gang of Four had some real influence on this dialogue with the U.S. and uh, the mood turned, uh, turned a bit sour. And uh, one aspect of it, uh, just to link it to the comment earlier about uh, sort of intelligence sharing, uh, the Chinese became uh, antsy that we were taking them for granted because we were trying to make them aware of the Soviet threat. And so they tried to say to us, uh, don't worry about us, we can take care of ourselves. And they developed a public uh, slogan uh, that the, the Soviet revisionists, the Soviet Union, was preparing to attack in the east, that is toward China, but they were really go were going to attack in, in the west against American interests as a way of trying to say to their own people and probably to us, uh, we can take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick may want to talk a little bit about the impact on other countries as yeah. a result of this. We, uh, because it wasn't just all happiness. Blowback. So Kissinger's secret trip was in July of 1971. Yeah. And Nixon didn't go until February of 1972. What was the blowback from our allies, Japan, Taiwan, any of the Europeans? Well, um, after the trip, after Nixon's trip, uh, our guys fanned out to various parts of, of uh but not of before Asia. Nixon's trip, not there, there was, after Kissinger's trip. Everybody was, the, the Japanese were particularly shocked. Uh, because we hadn't told them. We were their closest ally, and they, we hadn't told them. This is something very important to them in their backyard. Um, well, they got over it. Um, and 
And their immediate reaction was to immediately um, re normalize their relations with China and uh, become kind of the major, major channel to China, travel channel to China uh, in subsequent years. Um, I think that the, the uh, reaction of, of uh, the, the right in, in the United States was very negative. And this is the Taiwan lobby. This yeah, was the Goldwater and very lobby. Ne very negative. And uh, of course, after the trip, um, Warren Christopher was given the task of going to Taiwan and explaining what we'd done. And uh, what he got was his car got pelted with eggs and a variety of other things. So they were very <laughs> upset. But the, the blowback from the, 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 the secret trip was, was essentially shock. Yeah, well, I, I ought to say that you, we paid a certain price for secrecy, mm -hmm. uh, and a, particularly with Japan. Uh, but having said that, I think it was felt necessary because if there have been public signals in advance, first of all, we didn't know whether this was going to be this successful. This was uncharted right. terrain, so you didn't want to raise expectations and have a defeat. Secondly, if people knew in advance Henry was going to China, every lobbyist, not only Taiwan, but a, a, everyone else would be coming in uh, and our allies, and we would be constrained in what we could explore with the Chinese uh, once we got there. So the decision was made we had to keep it secret. I think in retrospect, we might have sent a low-level person like Holder Jimmy to Japan and tell the, the prime minister just so he could say to everybody I knew in advance. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that he would have to tell his cabinet and the Japanese press would get hold of it, right. and so the Chinese would feel we had betrayed the secret uh, principle. So, it was a tough trade-off, but I think on balance, despite the short-term price we paid, it was worth it. What about the reaction of the Vietnamese, our allies, in the Vietnam War after the Kissinger secret trip? I, don't, I think they were, they were shocked and concerned about it. Um, and, of course, after the president's trip had occurred, uh, there were some, some uh, different reactions happened. For example, because Vietnam really was a significant problem for us. I mean, for the mm -hmm. for President Nixon, he he had said he would end it. He wanted to. There were negotiations going on. Uh, and he had also seen what the previous president, Lyndon Johnson, have his presidency almost destroyed by the Vietnam War. Right. But in these conversations uh, during the president's trip, if I can just move to that, uh, the last conversation with Joe and Lai and President Nixon. They had been talking, we had been talking about, or he had, Nixon had been talking about uh, Vietnam and Chinese support for it, et cetera. And Nixon's, and Joe and Lai sort of made a diplomatic thing. We were not really going to meddle with that. And Nixon just sort of nailed it. He said, so you're not going to help us with the Vietnamese. And uh, <clears throat> he basically said, yes. And, and then that, that passed and, and uh, President uh, Nixon said, well, you at least will help us, won't you, uh, in, a, in uh, reaching a negotiated solution and not try to torpedo the negotiations as your Russian friends are doing, et cetera. So we were at least trying to say, please encourage them to negotiate. And, and President Nixon said, a negotiated solution is the only answer. There isn't a military answer to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just sort of was left that way. So the Vietnamese, uh, from what we could tell at least, were, were in real shock uh, that, uh, that the President of the United States had been there. He didn't know what Joe and Lai had said, obviously, back and forth, but they had their suspicions. And so, so they were very concerned. Well, what did they do? Well. They, they launched an offense. This was the end of February. They launched an offensive in early, uh, in late April, actually. And this caused us uh, to respond by doing something that was very nasty uh, in the Russian standpoint, because they were the main provider, although the Chinese were as letting these transport, transports go through China, et cetera, but the, the shipping and so forth. So we. We did the mining of Haiphong Harbor, the North Vietnamese ports, and a lot more intensive bombing in response to this major campaign that they started 
in the South, and they, they weren't negotiating. Uh, so, so they were not impressed in the sense, or they felt they, they I think they already had a campaign in, in mind, and this is why we responded. And the president, this is very courageous, and it's a little off the mark, but he had the summit with the Russians was already scheduled, and uh, he knew that they might cancel uh, that whole summit, uh, which would have been a blow in, in many, for many directions, uh, <coughs> when, when we, we, the difficult decision was made, and it was contested among those who knew about it, but the, the Joint Chiefs, uh, Admiral Moore, et cetera, were, were pushing for it, and uh, President Nixon decided, yes, we are, going, we are going to do this, and if it means that the Russian summit is canceled, that's fine. We went ahead and did it, uh, really minor blowback from the Russians because I think they really wanted to have the summit as well on their side. The Chinese complained, but not too seriously because they sort of had put Vietnam, that's down here, mm -hmm. we're talking big things and, and we've got big plans together. Two quick footnotes, uh, I don't want to get off too much on the Russian summit, but Nixon didn't want to go to Moscow with this tremendous offensive and not responding to it. He looked very weak in terms of what That's was true. happening in yeah. Vietnam. Yeah. Secondly, he was about the only one. Kissinger and most others thought that the Russians would cancel the summit. I remember flying in a helicopter with Henry up to Camp David to start writing the president's speech on the Haiphong Hanoi moves, yeah. and we were bemoaning the fact that all this careful preparation for arms control and the summit are going to go down the tubes. Nixon said, no, the Russians will go ahead. So that's to his credit. Mm -hmm. With the Chinese, the basic pitch was, you got a big stake in bilateral relations. We knew they had a little bit of problems with Vietnam historically anyway. You don't want us to be humiliated on the way out of Vietnam. That's not going to help us balance the Soviet Union with you. So uh, tell the Hanoi to settle for a military settlement only. We're willing to have a ceasefire, uh, withdraw of our troops, get our prisoners back. We're not willing to overthrow the Saigon government. Uh, and that's not in your interest to have us humiliated. So lean on your friends to be more reasonable for a military solution only. And you can tell them, in effect, time is on their side if they just wait it out. There's evidence that Joe and I and others did press uh, Hanoi, uh, less evidence that the Russians did because we were also pressing them to do this. But let, let's f switch um, foot forward then to the Nixon's trip because that's the one that we're now, that's the week that changed the world. Uh, I think that it's very difficult sitting today to, to understand what a profound and significant effect this had, not just on the world, but on the American people, on the Chinese people. Nixon's week-long trip in February of 1972, Nixon himself called the week that changed the world. And as the archivist said, even Secretary Kiss, uh, Clinton has said that was an underestimation of the profound significance of it. Um, before the trip, we were their enemies, and after the trip, we were their friends. Walk us through that whole week, and exactly, you all four were on the trip to China, Nixon's trip to China. What happened? How did it end up with Nixon sitting down with arch enemy Mao Zedong, who Nixon had spent his entire career as an anti-communist? Well, first, let me say, I, I've dealt with lots of presidents and lots of summits. I have never seen anybody work as hard or as brilliantly for a summit as Nixon did for this trip. He knew its significance with the help, great help of the State Department and the military and the CIA. We had these six big briefing books. I was in charge of sort of orchestrating them all. <laughs> they were this thick. And I swear to God, Nixon marked up almost every page of all, all six volumes. And as we were flying out there, we stopped uh, in Guam and Hawaii. And all the way on Air Force One, he was sending memos back to the back of the plane saying, I want some more information on this. And so this guy was really prepared. We get to China, we're in the guest house after one hour, Joe and Lai comes over and says, Ma wants to see Nixon right away. This was very unusual. He usually see leaders at the end of their trips. And it was very important because he was putting his imprimatur on this for the world and for his cadres and for the Chinese people that he blessed this trip and it was important. He wasn't gonna wait to the outcome. So to my eternal gratitude, Henry asked me to go along with him. Unfortunately, the Secretary of State was not invited. Uh, I, I stayed with the Secretary of State while he was not in, the, in that yeah. meeting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a great consolation, Such I'm great, sure, to the Secretary uh, of State. Guy, yeah. So anyway, let, let me talk about the meeting. First, uh, 
you have a temptation when you know someone's a great historical figure to say this guy's got magnetic strength. Uh, but I'm, I would say if we walked into a cocktail party and we didn't know who he was, the guy would still draw your attention. He would own the room. Yeah, he uh, would own the room. We actually, after the hour-long meeting, were somewhat disappointed initially, we meaning Kissinger and me, because Nixon kept trying to talk about substance and policy. And Mao would sort of say, that's up to Joe and Lai. And he'd give a brush stroke or two about the Russians, about Taiwan, about Japan. But he wouldn't, go, he wouldn't engage the president. So we sort of thought this was a little disappointing, frankly. As we went through the next few days with Joe and Lai, we realized just how subtle Mao had been that in his brush strokes and seeming casualness, he had gotten from one topic to another and gave just enough guidance and framework for the subsequent discussion. So we really appreciated the meeting, uh, meeting afterwards. But wasn't uh, there the expectation of a follow-on meeting? Yeah, we thought, there might, we thought naively that Ma never gets two meetings, that certainly the Secretary of State would have been invited to that and, and, and so on. Now, uh, very quickly, uh, this picture is proof that I was actually there because at the end of the meeting, uh, they came in with this picture and communiques about the three of us being there from the American side, and Nixon turned to Joe and I said, no, Mr. Lord was never here. And so they cut me out of the pictures, out of the communique, uh, <laughs> correctly, because it's humiliating enough for the Secretary of State not to be there with the National Security Advisor present, but to have some 30-year-old punk there as well, <laughs> and he's not there, really would have been over the top. So a year later, the Chinese gave me this picture to prove that, in fact, I was there. What were all the rest of you doing while, while Winston was with Joe and Lai, Mao Zedong, and I was sitting with Secretary Rogers, who didn't know that the <laughs> meeting was going on. Uh, but it was interesting because uh, the next day um, I went uh, and, and went on a little sort of private trip to the shopping district of, of uh, Beijing, and I saw everybody, huge crowds of people, all clustered around the. Um, uh, the display cases where they were showing the People's Daily. And that's the way people got their news, and that's the way people were in China were, were, were informed as to what they were supposed to think. And there was Nixon and Mao shaking hands. And it was an electric moment, and everybody was very quiet, but they were taking it all in. And of course, if I may be jumping the gun here, but you know, this trip was very, very carefully planned by the White House and the Chinese to have maximum um, public impact on the American people. Uh, the, the rhythm of each day was that you had uh, a telegenic event in the morning, you had a telegenic event in the evening, and you did all the, the, the work and the talking and so on and so forth in the middle of the day. And so the American people got um, Nixon on the Great Wall or the opening banquet or uh, other, other things at prime time, either breakfast or evening. And the impact of that week, I think, was to change the American attitude towards the opening to China. Could, could I just intervene? Sure, I absolutely. want John to weigh in here too. But uh, I want to double back quickly to the public October uh, 1971 trip after the secret trip so there setting was a up, secret trip which in July. Ron Walker was yeah. very crucial involved in all the logistics, security, press coverage, and the, the importance of press coverage for the reasons you just mentioned. Uh, but we, we did two other things. The Chinese very subtly were accustoming their own people uh, to this dramatic breakthrough. So we started out in small meetings. Then we went to uh, some cultural event where the cadres were there getting exposed to Kissinger and the others. Then we went to the Summer Palace and toured with ordinary Chinese tourists there. So they were gradually, day after day in October, accustoming the Chinese audience to what was, what was coming. Meanwhile, secretly, we were negotiating the Shanghai communique. Mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, we finished most of that, except for the slight exception of the <coughs> Taiwan issue, a minor problem. But almost everything else we worked out then. And I have to just take a minute on that, because it shows you how smart Joe and Lai was, or Mao. We, in October, gave them a draft of a possible communique looking toward February 1972. It was the typical draft, you know, kumbaya. I mean, sort of, you know, we're friends getting together and progress. I mean, some realism. We weren't totally stupid. But it was a fairly ordinarily diplomatic draft. We give it to Joe and Lai. Uh, 
He comes back the next day and almost literally throws it on the floor in contempt. He had obviously checked with Mao. He said, look, this is ridiculous. We, we, it's, it's dishonest. We, we fought each other in Korea. We hate each other. And suddenly, we're, we're, you know, we love each other. Come on. This is going to make our allies suspicious. It's going to upset our domestic audiences. Let's have a new kind of communique. Let's agree to have differences stated on each side, both in philosophy and ideology and on specific issues. Then when we can agree, those agreements will stand out as being more credible and the exceptions. We, on the one hand, it was good news, bad news. We realized the brilliance of this idea. But the bad news is we had about 36 hours before we were leaving. And so semi-panicked, semi-exhilarated, Kissinger asked me to do a, a redraft of our portions. We couldn't do the Chinese positions, but our positions and then where we might agree. I stayed up to three, and then I was supposed to wake him up. I handed it, and he redrafted it. And then the Chinese came back, and basically we got the communique done in that October trip, as well as the very important public stuff that Ron Walker and other White House staff did to set up the public and logistic aspect of the trip. So by the time the president had gone, the, the Shanghai communique had Except been Except for Taiwan, to... which is a major problem still to be negotiated between Kissinger and Joe and I yeah. during the president's trip. Uh, John, why don't you talk about during the president's trip, you were there, you were as a military officer. What negotiations were you having? I mean, what was, what was the military? Well, re really, it was just more of the same in the sense of uh, briefing about the threats that they had from so from, sharing American from Russia intelligence primarily. with the Chinese, yeah. and and, uh, and so we did some of that. Got to go on the Great Wall, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, which which uh, speaks again to these pictures that uh, appeared in Life magazine, you know, which was big then, and and so forth, and the the sort of communication of all those events mm -hmm. that occurred. But you know, like everybody else, I was sweating out the Taiwan issue and getting that right. I mean, this was this was a real crisis for us, those of us in the staff. Uh, Talk to us to a, a bit out. about the the whole China. What was the situation with China? I mean, it was a naval issue. China had talk about sort of what was the significance of Taiwan? We had a relationship with Taiwan, well, then this, we did. We had a number of we crises. We had a treaty with Taiwan. Yeah, remember they had the seat in the in the UN, which. <laughs> The PRC would 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 take, et cetera. But and they took it uh, as we were leaving the October trip. As we flew out, we got news of the UN vote, which was not the greatest ending to our trip. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no, exactly. But uh, the Taiwan has, has always been a major issue for the for the U.S. Navy. There have been a, a series of, of Taiwan crises, uh, near War Kamoi and Matsu in 1958. Uh, so particularly for for Navy people in the Seventh Fleet, which I was a associated with quite a bit. Uh, we, we really, the, we always had the war plan, et cetera, et cetera. And so there were, uh, how is Taiwan going to work out? Uh, the Chinese wanted us to uh, remove our forces in Taiwan. And I think the president was willing to do that if he had a Vietnam agreement. He said they're there to support our Vietnam, Vietnam problem. Giving the incentive the Chinese to lean on the Vietnamese. Right. Yeah. And then, of course, as you know, and Winston and others should talk about this, but it finally came with the formulation that, that everybody seemed to like, including uh, people in Taiwan and, and China. Uh, well, Chinese on both sides of the straits. So one China, two Chinas. One China, yeah, exactly. Nick? Recognize that there is but one China. And each one thinks it's them. Yeah, so this was a big change. We had a, we have a defense treaty with, with, with Taiwan. Taiwan. The, um, it is still totally resolved yet, but China, Taiwan is, China is Taiwan's biggest trading partner, et cetera. There's a lot going on of intercommunication today between those D during two countries. During that week, but there were three sets of talks that were going on. Mm -hmm. One was Nixon and Joe doing, discussing the, the world. Uh, and one was Kissinger and Chiao Wanhua discussing the actual wording of the Shanghai communique. <clears throat> and one was uh, Rogers and his counterpart, the Chinese foreign minister, Ji Peng Fei. And that was all about what we called the nuts and bolts of the relationship, trade, travel, mm -hmm. immigration, legal issues, education, et cetera, et cetera. Which later on, which was all new because we had had none of those agreements. We had with none the of those Chinese agreements, and we, we didn't we we didn't know anything. I mean, we had talked a little bit, but 
In fact, I remember during one of those talks, um, there was the Chinese say, was saying, you, you are still requiring us to be fingerprinted when we go to the United States, or if we go to the United States. And we said, no, that's finished. And they said, no, it's not finished. So Roger says, you go find out. So I rush out, and there's a White House telephone in the Great Hall of the People behind the door, <laughs> very discreet. And I call up, um, and it's a wonderful connection, White House switch, and then they get me the State Department Operations Center. OK, uh, Operations Center comes on. It's 3 AM in the morning. I say, um, wake up whoever is uh, responsible and find me the answer to this question, which they did. And then I went back in, and Rogers said to the Chinese, well, we do, no lo we do no longer require that you be fingerprinted, but isn't it good that we have good communications now? <laughs> so in any case, the nuts and bolts were being discussed. It was a very popular uh, forum because all the people who couldn't get into a meeting mm -hmm. and wanted to take part That's came and do. took part. So Dick, Dick, I want to talk briefly about the Taiwan issue and our, our yeah. comment as well, because that obviously was the crucial thing we have to get over. You may <laughs> but it worked beautifully. Was it bugged? <laughs> oh, yeah. Dick? Well, what is really significant was that uh, on the secret trip, my understanding, you, you were there, that uh, Kissinger laid out our position on Taiwan, and Joe said, fine, now we can talk about the, the rest of the world. And it was sort of brushed aside. And then uh, during the Mao meeting, and then subsequently reiterated by Chairman Mao, his position is, we don't need to resolve the Taiwan issue right now. Let us, we can resolve it after 100 years. Mm. We may have to fight at that point, but we've got many more important issues to deal with in the, in the short run. So the Taiwan issue, in effect, was, uh, was put on the back burner. And, uh, we can get off under the, the follow-through, but uh, uh, the reality is was that the cooperation was on these broader strategic issues, uh, and uh, there was, which we say, a kind of a gradual letdown on the on the Taiwan situation with the, the derecognition then occurring during the Carter administration, and uh, which we say we still, of course, maintain. A relationship with Taiwan. We have our internal law, the Taiwan Relations Act, which says we uh, will help them defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say the play out was favorable in terms of the larger strategic environment being the focus, and uh, the way that the Taiwan issue played out was uh, not the uh, sharp abandonment of, of a long term. Yeah, I would go beyond that. Here's the genius and the, and the courage of both leaders. Taiwan had said for 20 years, we won't even talk about anything except Taiwan. Now, they, we had moved in the secret channel, so we got a bigger agenda. We went there, and we had this bigger agenda. We may want to show the uh, Nixon, Joe, and Lai picture. But uh, the Chinese were willing, as long as they got certain principles, like all Chinese on both sides of the strait they believe there's one China, they are willing to put off other awkward uh, elements. Uh, and we were refusing to give them up, namely, our diplomatic relations with Taiwan, our security treaty with Taiwan, the fact that troops on Taiwan. People say that Kissinger and Nixon made these great concessions on Taiwan. Look at what the Chinese, that they went from saying, you know, you, you can't talk about anything else to tolerating an opening with the President of the United States while we were selling arms and had troops mm -hmm. in Taiwan. Uh, and so I think both sides were, were intent, as you say, to move ahead on the broader issues, like in the Shanghai communication, the reference, the communique reference to anti-hegemony, which was, of course, the Soviets. Uh, and in fact, we did not give up diplomatic relations or the treaty until President Carter normalized in 1979. And imagine this. Uh, when Kissinger gave a press conference on February 28 explaining the Shanghai communique, he, in the course of that, reiterated our defense commitment to Taiwan. We couldn't put it in a communique, mm -hmm. but we told Joe and I the night before we were going to do that. So he managed on Chinese soil to reaffirm it. I'm just making the point that the Chinese, as well as the Americans, showed great wisdom and courage on this issue. 
Okay. I th well, just the, uh, the threat that this initiative elicited for a number of countries and governments, Taiwan being one, shouldn't be underestimated. I mean, these are just uh, things that were not much on the, on the radar screen, but the, the uh, PRC, the, the Beijing sent a delegation to uh, New York when they uh, entered the UN. And one of their cooks was poisoned, and we assumed this was an intelligence operation. In Hong Kong, there was a publication of the Shanghai Communique, but lo and behold, the, one of the key paragraphs dealing with Taiwan was not included in this publication. So there were games being played on, on both sides uh, that reflect the sensitivity and, the, and the, indeed the threat of this, uh, this initiative. And uh, as, as Wynn was saying, it uh, reflected the, uh, the determination, the courage of the two senior leaders to follow through on this, that despite a lot of the uh, unhappiness or uh, worse that was going on on the sidelines, that the initiative was followed through. Talk to me about Japan, because the United States had been a close ally of Japan, treaty with Japan, and yet Japan knew nothing about either the well, secret Well, Japan, trip. of course, was very upset, the, uh, the shock, and they went ahead immediately. they have been holding up to normalize their own relations. But it was interesting, our discussions with the Chinese. When we first went there, Kissinger would tell Joe and I about the value of the U.S.-Japan alliance restraining Japanese militarism. If they're worried about Japan reviving World War II uh, uh, themes, uh, their best bet was let the Japan relax under our security umbrella. This, in the initial talks, the first couple of trips, Joe and I rejected this and said, no, no, you're just making Japan fat and happy and mm. you ought to get rid of this alliance. It shows you that discussions can really change people's mind. And over time, Joe and I, in effect, admitted that Kissinger was right that this is, uh, it's, it's actually good for China, at least for the time being, to have Japan not remilitarized because of our security umbrella. And in fact, Mao, in one of the subsequent meetings, uh, we had five of them that I was in, uh, scolded Nixon and Kissinger for hurting relations with Japan. And he told Kissinger, you come here all the time, why don't you go to Tokyo? Uh, and so it was an interesting uh, change uh, in their outlook. Evolution. And one last point on Taiwan. Thanks to eight successive presidents of both parties, there's been bipartisanship on this. I think we've managed the China-Taiwan equation extremely well. There's been tensions, ups and downs. We've gone ahead with this comprehensive, uh, major, positive, negative, sweet and sour relations with Beijing. At the same time, Taiwan, primarily because of their own people and their entrepreneurship and courage and good leadership, has first become uh, economic heavyweight, then a democracy, showing the Chinese like freedom as well, and they've had security with our umbrella. And we've done this balancing act, and Taiwan has prospered, and we've got this relationship with China. It's a major success story. Let me, let me go to the big sweep of history. Um, a lot of, some people have said, look, this was inevitable. It was going to happen anyway. It wasn't because of the James Bond Kissinger secret trip. It wasn't because of Nixon's strategic vision. This was just inevitable. It was going to happen. What do you guys think? And I'll start with you, John. I'm going to ask you all of the same question. Right. Was it going to happen anyway? No, I don't think so. I, th I think that these individuals, uh, we owe a lot of uh, thanks and respect for their, their wisdom in pursuing it. I think that uh, I'm not sure, you know, presidents differ one from the other. And Nixon had this uh, rich background or understanding of foreign policy. As Winston said, he, he worked, he studied it, uh, and he had his own thoughts. And frank, frank, frankly, even the, the Kissinger-Nixon relationship was interesting to watch because they needed each other. I mean, Kissinger was brilliant and a great thinker, et cetera, uh, but Nixon had a lot to add, hard questions, and, and the two working together it was a great partnership. As far as the Chinese are concerned, uh, I think we were, were lucky. You know, Mao had, was sick already and, and uh, didn't have many, much time left. Zhou Enlai, I think, is, it was, it was a, a critical person. And uh, we always learn in foreign policy about the handshake, that Dulles wouldn't shake his hand at a conference. And so we all shook hands with him. And I remember, Winston, when we were together, it was just Kissinger, Joe and Lai, you and me, and Nancy Tang, as I recall, as, a, as an interpreter. 
for just a little dinner. But I mean, there, there's, there was a, um, a wisdom there, a kind of long view. And, and Mao himself was, was, that's, was smart. And so I think we were very lucky. Uh, and then, of course, just the circumstances of the Russian pressure and other things that made this a possibility. But uh, it, it wouldn't happen in all situations, for sure. Mr. Diplomat? There's it? nothing inevitable about history. And um, ultimately, this would have happened, but you had to have a combination of political <coughs> will and diplomatic skill. And Nixon and Mao had the political will, and they were powerful people in their own communities and in their own body politics. And Nixon and Kissinger had, um, Joe and Lai and Kissinger had the tactical, political, diplomatic skill to make it happen. And that, those kinds of constellations don't come into alignment all that often. And we were lucky that that's what Dick, it was. Four great men changed history. Leaders do really make a significant <laughs> difference. I mean, uh, this is totally speculative, but uh, let's say Hubert Humphrey had won the 1968 mm -hmm. election. Now, I had the very interesting experience of leading a congressional delegation a couple of years later that was, the co-head was Hubert Humphrey. And so I spent two weeks getting to know the man. I didn't know him before then. Uh, my instinct is there wasn't the strategic vision, the broad vision, and the kind of experience that Richard Nixon brought to his uh, presidency. Remember, he had been Eisenhower's vice president. He had traveled all around the world. He knew these leaders. Then, of course, uh, he lost the 1960 uh, election, but continued to travel around the world during, during the 60s when he formulated this, uh, this approach with all this personal experience. Uh, Hubert Humphrey's experience was much more in domestic politics. Uh, how would he have handled a situation where, again, the great fear was that uh, the United States would be drawn back into a, a conflict with China because of the Vietnam War? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can say that he would not have had the broader Soviet element uh, and strategic uh, context that Nixon brought to the uh, initiative. Now, that's totally speculative, but leaders do make a difference. Only Nixon can go to China? Well, I agree with my colleagues about uh, this was not inevitable, or certainly not in the near term, and leaders count. The only point I would make also, Nixon's right flank was protected because he was a known anti-communist. And so his party uh, people, who might, some of whom might have suspected or not liked what he was doing, had to be loyal, although there were still some holdouts who were very angry no matter whether he was their president or not. And the Democrats were more apt to be sympathetic in some respects. So uh, the old cliche has truth to it, namely that Nixon could go to China. It would be a lot more difficult for a Democrat, because if Humphrey had tried to do this, he would have been hammered by the Republicans, mm -hmm. whereas Nixon could quiet th things down. I remember flying back after the Nixon trip on Air Force One. And Nixon and Kissinger and uh, those who were not so enthusiastic, like Pat Buchanan and so on, all wondered about what the reaction was going to be in the United States. We were not aware of these dramatic pictures of uh, the PLA playing turkey in the straw and Nixon and <laughs> Joe and Lai toasting each other and everything in the Great Wall. Uh, we didn't realize how popular it was. Of course, there were some who were upset, the Goldwaters and so on. Uh, and, and so it just shows you that even then, after the trip, and we we're flying back, they were concerned about the impact. It showed you the political courage that it took. So I would just underline what my colleagues said. Let me, let me add just one brief thing. When uh, Mao and Nixon had their, their discussion, Mao said to Nixon, I like to deal with rightists because they follow through on what they promise. Now, that, that was only some flattery or however you might want to put to it, but at least... No, no, I think he was sincere. I, I, well, particularly that's... balancing the Soviet Union was important. Yeah. So. Okay, I think we have just a few minutes left for final thoughts. John, I'm going to start with you and swing by. Final thoughts, not only the opening to China, but the significance of it. Well, I, th I think it was huge in, in, in history, certainly in our relationship and, and building for... for what is what we have now in terms of China is a very different uh, 
country. Uh, so I, th I think that uh, this, this was a, a very important, a very tricky, and as I mentioned before, an amazing year in which it wasn't just this, it was, it was the, the work with the Russians as well, and mm -hmm. Vietnam was still going on, and, and the, as, uh, uh, Winston can talk more ab about those excruciating uh, uh, efforts that were made to try to get them to, to sign up and, and make, a, make a treaty. And uh, I can remember we were bombing with B-52s on Christmas Day of 72. But soon afterwards, uh, we had an agreement. And then you can say, well, <laughs> what happened then? We were, but in any case, there's, uh, this was a very important uh, juncture in our foreign policy, I think, in, in developing it and maturing our uh, approach to the world. Nick? I think the, the, uh, the, the Nixon trip was, was um, a, a cataclysmic diplomatic event. But what it led to was an extraordinary meeting between the Chinese and the American people. I was in the liaison office when we set up a 14, 14 months later. And that began uh, the uh, meeting of Chinese and Americans, traders, bankers, students. Um, we watched all these delegations come in. We put them together. And the same thing was going on in Washington. And it, it, it was all the nuts and bolts, really. I mean, the, we, we'd laid the groundwork during the Nixon trip, and the, the, the breakthrough had occurred. But now these two peoples were beginning to figure out how to work with each other. And those relationships have become so huge that they, uh, in, they, they really actually run the relationship. And in 1989, the Soviet Union collapsed, and Tiananmen occurred, and so on and so forth. But the relationship went on because of these ties. Dick? Well, I think it's worth just reiterating that the Nixon Mao initiative really was probably one of the most transformative diplomatic initiatives, certainly in the 20, 20th century. It, it really transformed the dynamic of international politics and great power relations. And uh, one way of looking at it from uh, today's point of view, you had a generation of leaders on both sides that were very worldly in the sense that they had been involved in the middle of the Cold War, the Vietnam. Uh, context, and that generation now is gone. And one of the things looking at the world today, 2014, is uh, we don't seem to have uh, the experiential leaders who that have that sense of international affairs. Now that may be unfair to leaders today, but one has to be impressed by the, the vision, the experience, and uh, ultimately the, uh, the initiative that was taken uh, by President Nixon, and we can get off into Mao's motivation, which was complex also. But it was a world-changing initiative. Winston, yeah, final and, word is yours. In addition to the U.S.-China relationship, it shook up the whole international landscape in ways we don't have time to go into now. But it was, as many of us have said, and we all agree, it was genuinely transformative. The last point I make is on the evolution of U.S.-China relations as we meet today it's just been the latest summit between American and Chinese leaders uh, in Beijing. And if you look at decade by decade, you can see how this relationship has evolved. In the 70s, it was mostly balancing the polar bear, the Soviet Union, and conceptual structural discussions because we didn't have normalized relations. There's not real content. Uh, Nick and the State Department laid some essential groundwork, but there really wasn't much because we didn't have diplomatic relations. 79, we had diplomatic relations. So the 80s was spent trying to flesh out this relationship in addition to the continuing anti-Soviet dimension to have other aspects, which were crucial because, as you said, in 89 and 92 things happened. Tiananmen Square, which elevated human rights in our relationship with China and complicated it, and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the disappearance of the Soviet empire and the Soviet threat, therefore you didn't have that glue for our relationship. And so we spent the 90s sorting out these problems and establishing a new relationship. And then the 2000 and since, it's been the, the issue has been China's growing economic, military, and diplomatic power <coughs> and how we relate 
not a rising power, because I consider China a returning power. They were number one for about 4,000 years. <laughs> How do you relate them to the established power and not repeat the historical examples of 11 out of 15 of these uh, phenomena have ended in, in, in conflict? So we have now the most important relationship in the world and the most complex relationship in the world. And I would end on a famous headline and that you started with, and it happens to be true. This was the week that changed the world. I think this is a profound example of the people who really did work for the men who changed the world and were the giants of American history and the, the significant impact that you've had individually, collectively, on not just the United States but on the world is something that we should all applaud. And it was so significant that I think we're going to ask them back to do another panel to talk about the relationship of the United States after the Nixon presidency because although Nixon left office, in 1974, he continued to travel to China. He continued personally to write about it, think about it, and expand the relationship. But for now, I want to thank Admiral John Howe, Ambassador Nicholas Platt, Ambassador Richard Solomon, and Ambassador Winston Lord. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.